been with us for the hour as we unpack the concept of cumbering, which prevents people from bringing their authentic selves to work. So let's turn over to our speakers today. We're very pleased to welcome the foremost expert on covering, author and Chief Justice Earl Warren Professor of Constitutional Law at NYU School of Law, Kenji Yoshino. Hello, Kenji. Hi, Gabe. It's great to be here. And we're so glad you could join us. And leading our discussion today, our co-founder and CEO, Dr. David Rock. Hello, David. Thanks, Gabe. Good to be here with you. And Kenji, great to see you again. It's been, uh, it's been far too long. I, uh, I, every time we share a stage somewhere over the last few years, we, uh, I, I guess I should stop being surprised that we end up in parallel paths in some way. We end up kind of with similar thoughts, but coming at it from different angles. It's always a delight to uh, reconnect and see what, what you've been working on. So great to, uh, great to have you here today. Thanks for making time. Likewise, um, David. Thanks for having me. Yeah, no, it should be fun. I want to dig in just a quick second for those of you new to NLI. We are, um, uh, we've been around for a long time, 23 years actually, is uh, since we started um, operations in 24 countries, working with over 50 of the Fortune 100. And the core of our work is, is science. The core of our work is science to build better people strategies, or as we say, making organizations more human through science. And certainly in the last year, um, the work we've been doing for the last seven years on diversity, equity, inclusion became very front and center. Um, we've been incredibly busy in, in that space, but it's uh, our biggest practice, but not our newest practice. We've been in that space for quite a while, although uh, not as long as you, Kenji. This has been a, your life's work for a long, long time, as I understand. Uh, tell me, um, you know, we want to kick off with this whole concept of, of covering before we even get to that. Um, kind of power and privilege is such an important piece of the puzzle. Um, tell us, um, uh, tell us from your perspective, what, like, what is power and what is privilege and um, how does all that work? Great. Uh, so I'm going to start with privilege because I think that this is like the most misunderstood word in the diversity and inclusion space where you know, we define privilege at our center as unearned privilege, uh, so unearned advantage, excuse me, that flows from a demographic characteristic. So this could be uh, privilege on the basis of your race or ethnicity or privilege on the basis of your gender or based on your sexual orientation. And the reason that we think that it's so uh, reviled is that, you know, I don't know how you feel about this, David, but for a long time, we used to not lean into this word because people had such an aversive reaction to the comment, check your privilege, right? And there are even studies, as you know, on this about the hard knock life effect of, yeah. you know, yeah. if I tell you that you're privileged, then you will tell me that you had a, a much harder childhood than if I tell you that you're not privileged. So we have a okay. aversive reaction to it. Now organizations, I think, are really leaning into it and are being much more sort of proactive about saying, we have to both talk about it and sort of diffuse all these misconceptions that people have. Because when I say you're privileged, I'm not saying, you know, you grew up with a silver spoon in your mouth and all lights turn, turn green for you down the highway. I'm just saying you're privileged on this particular uh, dimension of identity. And then yeah. power is a broader term, right? In the sense that power is just the uh, authority that inheres uh, based on your role. Uh, in you. So it could be, you know, as a tenure professor, I have power uh, that doesn't actually trace back to any kind of uh, demographic characteristics that I hold. As CEO of your organization, you have power that uh, doesn't actually flow directly from uh, your demographic characteristic. Right. Interesting. You know, going back to the privilege, I mean, do you have a hypothesis or the research on kind of why people react so badly? I mean, you can you sort of, you can sense from a gut instinct why it's a, you know, it's a, it's a status threat. Um, it, but but why, why do you think people react so, so intensely to the word privilege? I think it's because we all have forms of privilege and disadvantage. And so we don't feel seen or understood when somebody says to us, check your privilege. Uh, so in this hard knock life effect study, right, uh, you know, they split, you know, two groups. This is Taylor and Lowry, two psychologists, a group into a control group and, uh, you know, an experimental group. And under the control condition, people were just given a neutral prompt. The you know experimental group was given the prompt you know uh, black Americans have you know forms of disadvantage that white Americans by dint of their privilege don't have, and what they found was that the first group described a much happier childhood than the second group even though they were randomly split into these samples, and their hypothesis was exactly what you just said which is that the white individuals who were challenged on their privilege were like well that's actually not a full description of who I am I mean I may be privileged but. Like you're assuming that I grew up in some kind of, you know, I'm dating myself, but like a dynasty kind of, you know, multi-billionaire existence right. where we were all oil tycoons. And in fact, 
you know, I had all these forms of disadvantage. So you actually are not seeing me as a full human being. So I think it's actually mm -hmm. on a benign, you know, way of looking at it, uh, really just an attempt to correct the record and to say, I'm trying to see you, you as a full human being. That's what you're asking me to do. I ask you to return the favor and see me as a full human being and not just right. as a stick figure of somebody who, you know, is privileged along all dimensions. Yeah, yeah, we might, we, I might dig into that further in some writing later on with my team. I think it's a really interesting uh, kind of mechanism that happens there. And, and, and I think it's, it's um, yeah, we, we, we feel a, a status threat. We feel like we're being attacked as though, you know, everything was privileged and then we want to defend ourselves and say, no, 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 this was hard, this was hard. This was hard. And, and it creates this kind of weird dynamic. And I, and I think it's, um, yeah, it's an interesting thing we might dig into more later. A lot of people online are, are reacting to the, the word unearned. I also really like that term. I think it it's kind of labels something that it's it's something that you kind of, you, you didn't have to earn it, it just happened. And so, um, you know, maybe you should work harder to, you know, work with it in some way. Um, it's it's an interesting phrase, but yeah, interesting. Well, I mean, let's, let's talk a little bit about um, about, you know, covering then. So, you know, that's power and privilege. Um, so in terms of covering, this is a big body of work of yours for a long time. When, when did you first start working on covering? Well, actually, it's been, it's almost embarrassing that I'm still talking about it, although I do view it to be part of my life's work. So I actually wrote the Law Review article that was my tenure piece at Yale uh, 20 years ago. Oh, wow. And, you know, got tenure on the strength of that piece, largely and then flipped it into a book after it was featured in the New York Times. And then the book came out in 2006. And then I did a major collaboration with Deloitte and that extended from 2013. And then the paper was just republished again in 2018. So uh, this really has been with me for a very okay. long time. Yeah, it's, it's, and, and then finally people are listening to it a lot more. Suddenly, 20 years later, it's amazing. <laughs> I know, it's, uh, these, these, sometimes big things take a very long time. It's incredible. How do you define covering? So I define covering, uh, as you see here, as a strategy through which an individual downplays a known stigmatized identity to the uh, blend into the mainstream. And I italicize the word known there in order to distinguish it from the more familiar term passing, because I often get asked, how is this different from passing? When you're passing, people literally don't know you belong to the group, either because, or they literally don't know, right, that you, you belong to the group. When you're covering, people know you belong to the group, either because you're unable to hide it or unwilling to hide it but they nonetheless put pressure on you to edit, modify, downplay that identity so that they can be more comfortable around you. Right. And you know, to tie it back to power and privilege, obviously if you're in the disempowered or disadvantaged side of the power and privilege you know, uh, uh, conversation, then you're gonna experience uh, a much heavier demand to cover. Right, yeah, no, that's interesting. And I know you've done a lot of work on the data and kind of pulling this apart. Can you, can you give us the, cliff notes of the concept and also the data that you found around it and then we'll, we'll, we'll kind of absolutely yeah so you know this is you know uh, uh, an old body of work so anyone who's interested in, in this can just uh, google uncovering talent and a Deloitte white paper will pop up it was republished in 2018 um, so in the original book I disaggregate covering along these four axes and then what the paper does is to add some data to uh, substantiate the claims so the four axes of covering are appearance, affiliation, advocacy, and association. And uh, I know you have your SEEDS model. So we both are kind of, I think, similar, David, and in, in, in not wanting our, our ideas to just molder on a shelf. So we're really trying to come up with the mnemonics to help this land. So these are the four A's from my perspective. Right. Um, and so appearance-based covering concerns how individuals alter their self-presentation to blend into the mainstream. So a person might use a cane rather than a wheelchair to decrease uh, visibility or salience of its motor mm -hmm. function disability. So this is, you know, assuming that the person would feel less physical pain in a wheelchair, but there is substantial, you know, data to suggest that people often forego the paraphernalia that would allow them to function optimally in order to forestall the social discomfort people have when confronted with that paraphernalia. Right. Affiliation-based covering concerns how people avoid behaviors widely associated with their identity. And this is where we tie back into unconscious bias, right? Because people are trying to preempt triggering unconscious biases about their group. So a woman might avoid talking about being a mother because she doesn't want her colleagues to think that she's com less committed to work. So again, the difference between passing and covering is a woman can't do anything to pass, right? But she can cover by making her gender less salient by not talking right. about her children, we both know from Shelley Carell's work, the sociologist at Stanford, that there's a motherhood penalty and a fatherhood bonus. 
And so if a woman talks about you know, her children at work, she's going to take a pay cut. Whereas if you or I talk about our kids, we're going to get, if anything, a pay bump, a pay increase, right? Because different unconscious biases are triggered. We become providers, you know, who need to be paid more because we're more salary sensitive. Our female colleagues become caregivers who are going to get pulled out of the workplace, either literally or figuratively. Advocacy-based covering concerns how individuals avoid sticking up for their group. So a veteran might refrain from challenging a joke about the military, lest to be seen as overly strident. An association-based covering is how much individuals avoid contact with other group members. So for a gay person, this could be refraining from bringing a same-sex partner to a work function, but it could also be not joining an affinity group or not even having informal water cooler conversations with people of your own group, deciding who right. to sit next to or who not to sit next to. So, you know, when Deloitte and I collaborated, we actually pushed this out, you know, eight different sectors in the Fortune 500. They were wonderful. They created the survey. They put their whole people analytics team on this. I'm not an empiricist, so this is actually not uh, right. in my wheelhouse. And so they said, we'll put our money where our mouth is. We'll push this out to our own clients. And so what we found was that, first of all, 61% of people reported covering along at least one of these dimensions. And that right. included 83% of LGBT individuals, 79% of black respondents, 66% of women, all the way down to 45% of straight white men. Right? So that's one point. The most interesting piece of this that we thought of when we looked at this was some kind of marquee finding that 45% of straight white men were right. poor. And this made right. it a kind of universal project. And for those of you who are scratching your heads and thinking, how on earth? does this ostensibly most privileged cohort cover, it goes back to what we were talking about earlier, David, which is that this is not a binary distinction between you know, uniform privilege and uniform disadvantage. So people who are straight white men still reported covering along top five axes, age, mental or physical disability or illness, religion, um, uh, veteran status, and socioeconomic uh, status or background, right? So those are the top five ways in which straight white men covered. But the other thing that we wanted to draw from that incidence you know, data was that there was a big contrast between the 45% of straight white men and the say 79% of black respondents or 83% of LGBT respondents who reported covering. And that suggests that you know, some groups are still experiencing much greater headwinds in organizations that the tax is paid by every cohort, but not at even rates. Right, it's so interesting. Yeah, there's 45% there's of straight white men covering um, it's uh, it's it's so unexpected, isn't it? It's uh, it's really interesting. Um, yeah, and I think that you know you just see the body language when we flash that data up, you know, in front of our audiences, where you know people you know uncross their arms, their body language relaxes if they happen to be straight white men. They kind of turn to you know the presentation in a different way, and their feet stop pointing at the door. So a friend of mine who's a body language expert says you always know where people want to go by where their feet are pointing, right? So. Right. Literally, you can see feet sort of reshuffling and realigning right. towards me when I give that data. Interesting. Of course, yeah. you know, if I can sort of land the plane there, I mean, even if the incidents were high, if the impact were low, then this would not be an issue, right? Because we could just say, oh, this is just a form of executive coaching that I need to go through. I do it, but it doesn't hurt. But what we found was that of that 61% who reported covering, 60 to 73%, depending on the axis, said this was somewhat to extremely detrimental to their right. sense of self. So even adopting a relatively parsimonious definition of harm, a super majority of people said this hurts, right? Yeah. And then when we asked about organizations, you know, are your leaders expecting you to cover? 53% said, yes, our leaders expect us to cover. And then 50% of those said this somewhat to extremely diminishes our sense of commitment to the organization. Yeah, that's so if you're looking for where your employees are kind of browning out or burning out, this is a really good place to look for that leak in the pipeline. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, anything that affects our cognition, it, it particularly kind of forces us to kind of have to have to keep focusing on something, um, really um, debilitates our uh, cognitive performance. It obviously, increases stress, but it, even surprisingly low levels. Um, very small things have quite a big effect, an outsized effect, non-obvious effect on on our ability to think well and perform well in, in cognitive tasks. Um, and you know, I think about. Um, for example, there's a whole lot of studies that uh, initially James Gross did, who was kind of the founding father of emotional regulation. And then Kevin Oxner at Columbia repeated a lot of these. And they looked at what happens when you basically try not to show people that you have emotions. So they did these really interesting studies of looking at the brain's emotional centers when people are you know, releasing emotions and also trying not to show emotions. And it turns out just trying to hide your emotions um, has, has a huge debilitating effect on your memory 
uh, they actually were able to correlate it and say it's really similar to like literally watching television and paying attention to that while someone's talking to you. Like you remember as little of what someone said if you're trying to suppress an emotion. So, you know, we know suppressing emotions actually makes the emotions worse and reduces cognition and has all these other effects. Um, and I think it's just in a similar way, kind of suppressing who you are and trying not to show things just takes so much cognitive load um, that it's like this, this hum that's always there um, that's inhibiting good thinking. And so it's going to inhibit deeper thinking that requires a quiet brain as well. Um, so that's, that's how we think about it. And so, so, so make a link for us as we, as we sort of shift out of this chapter a bit, uh, make a link for us between covering privilege and power. <laughs> Tell us about kind of the three of these together. How do you see, it, see them? Yeah, absolutely. So the notion is really like, you know, privilege and power make visible to us, right? Um, that, um, or actually, I think a better way to put it is if we are privileged and powerful, covering is invisible to us. Or if you're on the less privileged or powerful side of the equation, then you feel it on the bone how much you're asked to cover. Just exactly what you just said, you know, that individuals are saying, you know, I know exactly what I need to do, or I think I know exactly what I need to do in order to fit in and advance at work, in order to navigate my power and privilege. There's nothing I can do about demographic characteristics like race or gender or sexual orientation. I cannot change those things, but I sure as heck can change the way in which I represent those things in the workplace. And that's where covering <laughs> comes in, right? And so employees, whether rightly or wrongly, are making all of these decisions. And employers are kind of tearing their hair up saying, well, we're not asking any of that. And sometimes the employers are wrong and sometimes they're right. And even in the cases in which they're right in which the employee has sort of misinterpreted a covering demand that doesn't actually exist in the workplace, the employer is still responsible for it, right? The employer has to be the first mover in dispelling that, right? right. So this to me is a difference between diversity and inclusion on the one hand and diversity or inclusion. I think we talk a really good game about diversity and inclusion but too often it's diversity or inclusion. It's like, we will have lots of different people around the table, but only so long as they're all covering the heck out of themselves, right? Uh, right. And so forcing people to the choice of either I can be fully authentic and risk exclusion, or alternatively, you know, I can tamp down the things that make me different behaviorally uh, and uh, minimize my difference to allow people to find me more palatable then I will be included, but only at the cost of doing that work. And ultimately, from a dignitary perspective, ultimately only at sufferance, right? Because I know that the minute I stop managing my identity in those ways, uh, then I will be excluded, right? Yeah, there's so lots of- A direct of outcome of power and privilege, right? Covering is what you do when you don't have power and privilege. You don't have, you right. accommodate other people's power and privilege. Right, right. You're accommodating people's power and privilege. You're trying to deal with it and reconcile it. I, I want to just take a minute and just kind of link to some of the research we've done as well, which I think ties really nicely to what you're talking about. And it's more looking at the kind of biological basis of how this stuff happens. Um, and then we'll take some of the interesting questions coming in. I see some great comments and questions that are, are coming in. The, um, we did a piece of research back in early 2018 into 2019. We published it basically on um, how power actually affects the brain. And it, it's really a, one of what we call our synthesis studies, where we're synthesizing huge bodies of research um, to try to find the signal that is then very sort of applicable. So kind of how do we synthesize and simplify all the different findings into something that you can use? Um, and we, we do that a lot. And so this one, uh, we also did a, a, a kind of summary of this in Fast Company. Uh, you can see on the right there, power changes your brain. It's always a good thing. And, and it turns out that there are uh, very, very significant, easily uh, noticed effects of power at surprisingly low levels, like literally get a team of people together in an experiment, you know, as a cohort, get them doing something and then randomly pick one person and say, you're just slightly in charge of everyone. Um, and then measure what happens in the brain before and after. And it's really different. Um, all this stuff starts to happen at even low levels of power difference. And without you know, going too far into it, there's sort of three categories of issue. And the first one really relates to what you're saying. It's essentially when you get even a little bit of power, when you start thinking about other people, um, you think about them from the concept of your goals and you see them as, as objects for your goals. And, and, and essentially you objectify them in the, in the, in the literal sense of the word. You, you turn them into objects in your brain, turning down literally the people focus network of the brain, um, which is more the medial and turning up the conceptual focus, which is more lateral. So you're actually turning down 
um, the, the social network of the brain when you think about people, when you have power. Um, and so literally you won't notice they're covering because you don't notice any of their issues. You don't notice their facial cues. You don't notice their emotions. You're, you're actually not even noticing them as people. You're noticing them as concepts and filtering their movements, their facial cues, everything through the lens of, you know, how they can be helpful to you, but as concepts. So it's a very deep research on that. And the second thing that happens is that you essentially become overly optimistic. I'm not overly optimistic, but you, you're just more optimistic. As soon as you have more power, you become more optimistic. So you're, you know, you're being more hopeful, optimistic, um, you know, thinking about the future positively. Uh, now, all of these things are adaptive, it, it turns out, for, for powerful positions. They have some adaptive value, but some dark side. Um, and the third one, basically, you, you lift up to vision level or more abstract level. So you think conceptually about people uh, and, and everything. You think more conceptually with a little bit of power and less concrete. So essentially, you, you, you don't focus on people as people. You become quite optimistic and you think very abstractly. And so you miss a lot of information, a lot of details with a little bit of power. And I think you know, what, what's happening is people on the other end of this feel like they're not heard or seen or validated at all. They're not, you know, their problems are not validated because they're just, you know, the boss is just being optimistic and they're not even, the details aren't being heard because the boss is just high level. And, and I think there's all sorts of experiences that start to happen. So that's how we approach it. We've been thinking a lot for a long time about kind of how to offset these. And we're, we're working on a solution this year around empathy and how to teach people to really, as, as folks in power, how to really turn this around. Um, and listen much more deeply, but through a kind of brain lens. So anyway, that's, that's kind of the way we've been approaching this. Uh, a couple of really interesting, uh, you know, comments coming in. Um, lots of interesting stuff in the chat. I mean, there's a whole question. This comes up a lot is how authentic can you be? You know, is, is professionalism just a, a kind of masking? Um, like how authentic really can you be in an organization? Or, you know, is covering a good thing? And do you want to address some of that? I, yeah, thank you for that, whoever asked that question, because, you know, I actually load this into the talks I give uncovering because I get this question so often. Right, right. I think we're all imagining, you know, I come work for you and then I show up tomorrow, you know, at your workplace and I say, you know, I'm going to engage in rapidly antisocial behavior, but I just have obnoxious personality syndrome. So this is my authentic self. Deal <laughs> with it. Right. So, I mean, the first question is, are all forms of covering bad? And the answer to that's obviously no from the example that I just gave. Some forms of covering are even beneficial to the smooth functioning of an organization, much less neutral, right? Much less bad, right? But I think that that just raises a much harder question of how do we distinguish between the good and bad forms of covering, right. like acknowledge that they're good and bad forms. And our touchstone is a really simple one, which is organizational values, which is that if the organization is saying, we believe in uh, this particular metric of inclusion, then it shouldn't require covering along that dimension. So in our survey, a lot of people said, I have to cover my political affiliation as a liberal or conservative right, right. Democrat, Republican. We were like, no harm, no foul, because none of the organizations that we surveyed said, you know, this may be different today, and this may be different in some organizations, but at the time of the survey, no organization that we surveyed said, we believe in the capacity to express your political affiliation at work as a, one of our dimensions of inclusion, right? Whereas every single organization that we surveyed said, we believe in the inclusion of women, but every single organization that we surveyed also said, you know, we as women in this organization have to cover, particularly on this ground of caregiving, right? We have to cover right. our status as parents and as mothers. So in the yes. first instance, we don't have a problem. In the second instance, we do have a problem because the organization is living under its value of inclusion rather than living up to the value of inclusion. So right. once an organization states we believe in inclusion on any of the dimensions that I was talking about, you know, veteran status, disability, race, gender, sexual orientation, then it should not be imposing covering demands along those grounds. Right, right, right. So it ties to their stated values and stated goals around inclusion. I mean, it's a really interesting question. I'm reflecting on it. We might do some more writing on that as well. Maybe reach out to you just sort of how do you define good versus bad um, covering. It's a really interesting question. Um, it's a really interesting piece to think about. Let's go to chapter two. I'm just aware of the time. We're having a great conversation. It's so far not a difficult one. It's the opposite. It's fascinating and it's lots of questions. We've got about 500 people with us on the line. Uh, lots of others watching and listening and other platforms as well. Uh, but let's talk about difficult conversations. And, uh, you know, this is, it, it, it's sort of like chapter one is sort of kind of understanding it. Chapter two of this is, is I, I guess, sort of how do we then broach these things and how do we really interact better? Um, it's such a big area. It's something that, that 
um, we think about a lot, a lot of the work we do is, is changing habits around conversations. So literally kind of repathing the way you would have these conversations. But I love the way you've been thinking about this. Uh, tell us about difficult conversations um, around, you know, not just covering, but also power and privilege and, and all of this. Yeah, thank you for that um, pivot, because that's exactly the way we um, think about this new project. So this is a book that I'm writing with my executive director, David Glasgow, and it's going to be published by Simon & Schuster next year. And we have tentatively titled it The Art of Diversity Conversations, so though please don't hold us to that title, because as you know, uh, it may change in between now and when the book uh, hits the stands. Uh, but essentially, this comes out of the work on covering, where people said like, okay, like teach me how to have the conversation with my manager where I say, I don't think you're living up to your values, right? And we realized that we didn't have the kind of toolkit that we could just hand to somebody and say like, here are the kinds of moves that you can make in the conversation. And the more we delved into it, David, the more we realized that we actually don't want to give people those tools. We actually want to give the managers the tools, the people with the privilege and the power the tools to invite those conversations because we're so tired of putting the onus of change on the people who are least empowered in the exchange, right? So this book is really about the kinds of posture shifts as somebody who has power and privilege you might need to make in order to have a more productive uh, conversation. So just really quickly, and this in itself is obviously a whole project unto itself, so uh, maybe we can have a, a longer conversation about it at some other point, but just to give the a pricey, the first point is that when we're privileged, we're often very, very fragile. We're used to being comfortable, right, to your point. And even small challenges to that comfort, this is Robin D'Angelo's work in White Fragility. I disagree with lots of things in that book, but you know, this point of it, I think, is like critically important and sound, right, where she says, you know, we think about power as leading to resilience, but it's exactly the opposite. Power leads to fragility. When you challenge somebody, uh, who is white about their racism, they're not going to have a resilient response if they're powerful. They're going to have a fragile response more often than not. And so what we're trying to do is to try and teach people to move from fragility to resilience. And that can be anything from a kind of Angela Duckworth, you know, grit model of like, pull your socks up, like, you know, not feeling comfortable is different from not feeling safe in a conversation. So you really need to suck it up for the greater good. And then also in a more kind of you know, tender way, right, saying, you know, actually, let's look at grief models, like Susan Silk's work on saying, you know, uh, there are concentric circles of grief. If you're the person who really needs help, then you are allowed to vent and to, you know, uh, mm -hmm. ask for help from other people. You're just not allowed to ask for help from the person you're trying to help yourself, right? So if the affected person is, you know, a Black employee of yours who's saying, I'm traumatized by Black Lives Matter, and you're trying to help them, you're not allowed to vent to them about your own fragility. You need to go home to your spouse or to right, somebody who's right. a, a circle out in those concentric circles of support or a friendly colleague uh, to do that venting. The second one is um, that when we're privileged, we're very ignorant and we're very comfortable in our ignorance. So, you know, back in the day, it's a literary scholar who actually made this point, Eve Sedgwick, where she said, if Mitterrand and Reagan, again, dating myself, you know, have a summit, what language are they going to speak? And you would think that because knowledge is power, right, that Mitterrand would get to choose because he speaks both French and English. But because Reagan has more power, although less knowledge, he gets to command the terms of the debate. And so he's monolingual, Mitterrand is duolingual or bilingual. Guess what language they're going to talk? They're going to talk English, right? Mm -hmm. And so similarly, like someone, I saw a question about code switching earlier. Yes, code switching is exactly what covering is all about. It's just a subset of, of covering. But like, the person who's a minority in the workplace is gonna to have to code switch like crazy. They're gonna to have to master the dominant norms of the workplace. The person who is a manager, let's say the stereotypical sort of white male manager, is not gonna to have to understand those other cultures or those other languages, right? Because the workplace right. has been historically structured around uh, their norms. And so we need a shift in posture from ignorance to curiosity. Right. And then finally, reductive to holistic, and this actually ties back to exactly what you were saying, I think, although you can correct me, David, to what you were saying about how we literally objectify people when we're in power. Uh, I actually look at this through uh, the Yale psychologist David Berg's work, where he says, when we're powerful, we over-index, right, on individual relationships. Like, you know, you and I will have, be having a conversation, and, you know, if you, you know, are uh, the more privileged in the conversation, uh, you're going to think about us as having a conversation as just, you know, Kenji and David are talking. 
Whereas I might think about this constantly through the lens, you know, as somebody who's a racial minority, as someone who's a gay man of, you know, oh, actually I'm experiencing a dynamic here that I think is affected by my race. And then when I bring that up, you might well say, oh, Kenji, don't make this about race. And my reaction might well be, I didn't make it about race. Society made this about race. Like I'm just, this is not me inventing something. This is me right. detecting something, right? So moving from that kind of reductive to holistic, right, framework is really important, right? Because we do have a tendency to reduce people to stick figures. And particularly for privilege, we like to think yeah. of things as individual to individual interactions rather than group to group interactions. So the more privilege party will over index <laughs> on how much this is about individuals. And if anything, right, the underprivileged person will over index on how much it's, it is about groups. But it's really important to at least have both frames in mind when you're trying to have these right. Yeah, that's interesting. I think it does come back to just the way even a little bit of power makes you, you know, conceptualize people as essentially, you know, stick figures, like it takes the meter, it takes the emotion, takes the, you know, people's intentions, goals, emotions, ambitions, all of that out and just treats them as, you know, kind of a number or a concept. Um, it's, it's literally an object versus a person. Um, and it's in the in the brain everything is classified either as an object or person although we we actually personify we we have a, a strong tendency um anthropomorph to can't remember the exact word anthropomorphization or something like but we anthropomorphize and um we turn you know very simple concepts into uh, humans a lot so the brain often takes you know a stick figure and imagines it's a person but we go the other way also. And so everything's categorized in the brain in, in this realm of, is this a, is this a human or a non-human thing? Um, and we, we do make things human a lot, but it turns out power um, turns that down, you know, switches that down. So it's, it's quite an interesting topic in itself. We might do some more, uh, some more work on that and maybe get a guest on to kind of just dig into the power issue and how power affects the brain. We've done a couple of summit sessions uh, on this, maybe my team can put that in the chat. But let's let's keep going. Um, we also wanted to talk about, you know, as it relates to conversations, we've got about 15 minutes, 20 minutes total left. But let's, um, you know, as we talk about com conversations, what are some of the remedies that you're seeing? Uh, yeah, uh, this is going to be a blitz. Yeah, so because I really want to get to allyship, which is our third and last chapter. So. Let me just say that if you're having these difficult conversations about covering or any diversity and inclusion topic, there are three ways it can end, right? One is a kind of happy way of like greater understanding and kind of, you know, mutual respect, right? And so I haven't even put that on the slide because that happy outcome is, is, you know, speaks for itself, right? And tells its own story. But, you know, there are other circumstances in which, you know, say I'm the privileged party, I realize that I've done something wrong and I need to apologize. And, you know, power and privilege, again, you know, mess this up for us. We are terrible apologizers. First of all, we've never been taught to do it, but even people who know the basics of it get it wrong because they're riven, right, in between their desire to hold on to as much power and privilege as possible and not make themselves too vulnerable and their desire to do the right thing and, and make the thing, you know, um, um, to, to settle the dispute, right? Um, and then the, the third way it could end is with disagreement. And this is really increasingly important because people are like, I'm not even going to have this conversation if my only options are we're going to come to a happy outcome or, you know, I'm going to apologize to you. Like there has to be some room in this where I get to disagree, right? So, you know, let's say like, you know, people get interrupted in a meeting a lot and then a woman comes to me as a manager and says like, you know, I have to engage and overcome my advocacy-based covering and say like, you know, you interrupted me because I'm a woman. And I say back to her, I really don't think I'm doing that. You know, like I really think that everybody is interrupting everybody else. So this is a high octane work environment, right? There are actually studies that show that I'm probably wrong, but in order for me to feel like I can have that conversation, there at least has to be some space for me to say, it can't be that the only way that this conversation ends is for me to agree with you, either in the kumbaya sense or in the I owe you an apology right. sense, right? Mm -hmm. So how do we usefully disagree? So what we sort of step people through is like the four components of uh, the apology. We see there are the four A's of covering. These are the four R's of apology. Recognition, responsibility, remorse, and reparation, right? So recognition mm -hmm. is like clearly stating what, you know, you think you did wrong, right? So yeah. no, this is like no if apologies. You can't say if I did this or whatever I did, I'm sorry, because that negates the apology. Responsibility is a kind of but apology. You can't say, I'm sorry I did this, you know, but I was ambient tweeting, as Roseanne Barr said, right? Uh, that totally negates the responsibility as well. You have to, uh, the apology as well, because you have to assume responsibility. Remorse is you have to really mean the I'm sorry, right? So 
Mario Batali has this great example, you know, great in quotes there, where he apologizes for his sexual assault, but after the apology is a postscript, he says, for those of you who are interested, here's a great recipe for, you know, pizza dough cinnamon rolls. And it's like, what are you doing? You know, I have no belief that you're remorseful about this at all. And then finally, reparation is, you know, we think of apologies as the end of something, but they're actually the beginning of something, right? right. You have to show through your future conduct that this is not going to happen again, right? So oftentimes people feel like this is incredibly burdensome because they're like, oh, I thought I was getting closure on this. And you are, right? But you're actually opening up, you know, something as well. Yeah. You're opening up an, uh, an obligation. It's really interesting just to spend a minute on this, the, the disagreement, you know, pe the people are bad at disagreeing. And, um, is it, you know, if we... We, 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 I, I agree, we really need to find a way to be comfortable with just disagreeing a lot, a lot better. I mean, one of the things, one of the big biases in the seeds model, experience bias, it's the, it's the second E, experience. And essentially what it says is that everyone sees the world differently and everyone thinks they see the world accurately. So if you get, you know, if you have a meeting with a, an, a leader, an engineer, a marketing person, a finance person and a lawyer, um, literally those five people are in a different meeting and actually hear different information because they, they hear a concept, they extrapolate it differently. They make different interpretations of it. Um, so they're in actually five different meetings. And one person might say, excuse me, might say, we all agreed. And another person said, might say, we all completely disagreed. Um, and, and in their experience, they're actually right. And the, the trouble is just the way that our brain is structured is we you know, literally perceive the world so differently that a, a lot of the time, even though certainly in the instance you mentioned, uh, you know, the woman might not be, you know, might be being talked over, but a lot of the time we just hear differently because we hear differently. And exactly. we, we need to be able to disagree and then find the kind of common ground and the shared goal and kind of get, get on with it. So it's really, really interesting and, and definitely dovetails, dovetails with the, the, the kind of neuroscience is how we process. Um, and if we're shying away from those disagreements, um, to be honest, the benefits of diversity are, are kind of minimal because if you're not able to debate, I mean, this is back to psychological safety. I know we have Amy Edmondson's actually with us as in the audience listening, making some interesting comments. Uh, she's, she developed that frame. Um, but a lot of this comes back to psychological safety is that you've got to feel safe to actually disagree and debate each other um, and kind of be able to speak up. We did a bunch of work on that in a solution called voice, um, just essentially teaching people how to challenge someone safely. Um, and, and how do you kind of call someone out in a way that's productive? Uh, so similar work we've been, we've been doing as well. Um, just kind of how do you, essentially how do you disagree productively? Um, I think is a really important thing. Let's, let's dig in, um, allyship is near and dear to both our hearts. Um, tell us uh, firstly high level, how does allyship fit in all this? And, and tell us about your passion for allyship and kind of how you think about it. Yeah, so, you know, I realize this is like the drinking out of the proverbial high fire hydrant for those of us, uh, for those listening in. So let me just try to organize this a little bit uh, in terms of like how I'm thinking about it, which is like a one, two, three kind of model. So sort of covering it, thinking about how you are, you know, thinking about your own identity and how you're going to carry yourself into the workplace. Then difficult conversations is really about what happens when you and I are sitting down, David, and you have an issue with me and I'm privileged along some dimension and you know, I have to be mindful of the cognitive ticks that I'm bringing into the conversation with me so I can have a useful conversation with you. You know, part three would be, you know, if you and I are having a dispute and then, you know, Amy Edmondson is listening in and then she realizes that she's going to be much more able as an ally uh, to speak on behalf of me as the affected party than I would be able to on my own behalf. So this is the part three. It's really the three person conversation where you're coming in from the side. You're not directly affected. But you've read Heckman and Johnson, you've read all the studies that say that sometimes people are better advocates for uh, disempowered groups and those individuals will be for themselves. And so it's a moral obligation, right, based on your greater, you know, ability, uh, opportunity to move the needle uh, for you to step in and be an ally. And so that's really what the work on allyship is all about. Fantastic. And, you know, you've... Um... We both worked on allyship in the last year, kind of, you, you probably for longer, but we started working with Microsoft about a year and a half ago. Um, I think they told us at the time they were working with you, we, we helped them think about kind of the critical habits that um, people needed to, to build. And, and one, some of the ones we anchored on was around um, what I was saying earlier, like how to actually speak up productively, how to kind of disagree with other people productively, how to call things out um, and how to do that, minimizing how kind of threatening it is as well. That's kind of 
one one of the pieces for us. Um, but for you, how you know how do you think about allyship? What's uh, I know you've done a ton of work with Microsoft on this as well. Um, yeah. So I mean, these organizations that sort of invite us in are such um, useful collaborators, uh, and we really owe so much to both Deloitte and Microsoft for our understanding of like you know how this stuff works on the ground because you know it's very easy when you're sitting in a kind of academic environment to have your argument smell of the lamp, right? But to actually get into an organization and uh, roll up your sleeves with them is, is something else entirely. So if we could actually go to the next slide, we actually developed um, this model actually was based already on Keith Edwards' work, uh, which is a tremendous work about a maturity curve of allyship. And, and then the second piece of it, which um, if we could stay on this slide, but I'll foreshadow the next one, called the empathy triangle. It's the empathy triangle that we developed in conjunction with Microsoft when they approached us uh, to uh, think about allyship with them. So I'll get to this in a moment. But uh, this kind of maturity curve of ally to one, ally to some, ally to all, just suggests you know, that all allies are not created equal, right? And that we can actually evolve as allies. So again, really quickly, ally to one is you're focused on an individual, you act when they need help, you're largely unaware of systemic issues, you view sources of non-inclusive behaviors as obstacles to circumvent and you don't perceive your own mistakes. So this is the beginning person who's not even thinking about DNI, but who's just like a, a good person, right? Like, who, I mean, at least the ally to one is better than an ally to not, right? They're thinking right. about somebody, they're thinking, they're being other regarding, right? So this is the, I have a female protege that I'm trying to get to the promotion process. I will help her whenever she needs help, but I'm not thinking about unconscious bias or challenges that she might face that I as a man didn't face. You know, I'm not even going to think about my own mistakes about DNI, right? Because I'm not even looking at the world through that frame. So most people and most of the organizations that we work with, David, are you know in the ally to some bucket where they're focused on a group. You know, they know about in groups and out groups. They know about unconscious bias. So they ask when they're inspired to do so. They don't need to directly be asked, and they seek to be an exception to the system as a whole. So on my team, you know, in my constitutional law group, you know, in my classes, I'm going to be an exception to that broader system of bias that I see. Here's the dark part of being an ally to some. Because uh, you divide the world into good people and bad people, mm -hmm. right? You tend to see sources of non-inclusive behavior as bad people. Right. And that makes admitting your own mistakes very, very risky. Because when you admit to your own mistakes, you risk falling into the bad category, right? The bad person category. And so it's very, very hard for you to admit to your own mistakes and therefore very hard for you to mm -hmm. adopt a growth mindset with regard to your mistakes. So what we're trying to get people to is this ally to all bucket where you're focused on everyone, including yourself, right? So this is the, you know, you can be, you know, Satya Nadella, or you can be, you know, uh, the person at the top of the tree as a straight white cisgender male CEO, right? Uh, and, uh, you know, you're still going to need allies, right? So someday your health privilege or your status privilege or your subject matter privilege is going to give out and you're going to be really glad you built a culture rich in allies. So this right. shares with covering the kind of drive towards universality. It's really because interesting, actually, just to comment there for a second, Keji, it's really interesting. We, we did a, a lot of research on inclusion um, over about two or three years. We published it a couple of years ago now. And one of the big findings was very sort of counterintuitive because the, the whole inclusion space is sort of like, you know, you've got to support, you know, women, you've got to support people of color, you've got to, you know, provide all the support. And what we found was that um, kind of focusing on individual groups was creating out groups, you know, here and there. And we ended up with this mantra of um, if you're not actively including, you're accidentally excluding. And sort of inherent in the actively including is everyone, right? Um, is that if you're going to be inclusive, you actually need to be inclusive with everyone all the time. Because um, if, you, if you're if you inclusive to some, as you put it here, you, you're going to create all these problems. And we did a whole lot of research on what those problems are and kind of how that works. And so our, our whole point of view on inclusion is make sure you're being inclusive with everyone in every interaction, um, but without over-including and trying to put everyone in every meeting. Um, so similar kind of thinking. Um, and uh, I think we've got an event coming up in a few weeks. We've got a couple of organizations talking about how to build inclusive practices during the crazy pandemic. I'm um, gonna hear some stories of sort of what that looks like, which I think will be interesting. But overall, I think we're really, um, we have some strong parallels in our thinking, which is good to see. Um, but yeah, Ally to All, tell me more about Ally to All. Like, how does that look? 
Yeah, absolutely. So I agree that the drive has to be relentlessly universal to the extent that it honestly can be, right? So you can't sort of jerry-rig it so that it's universal, right? Uh, just because you want it to be universal, it truly has to be universal. But as you've discovered and I've discovered, things like, you know, authenticity are universal human values, you know, uh, things like allyship are things that everybody needs. So I think we can honestly begin with the universal, show everybody that this is in everybody's self-interest. It will, of course, benefit some groups more than others, right? But it is in everybody's interest to do, right? Um, so an ally to all, you know, is different insofar as because they see this as a kind of form of enlightened self-interest, they act consistently by creating sustainable practices. So it's kind of baked into, you know, your own habit. So over time, this becomes so habitual that it's more instinctive for you to act inclusively than to act uh, non-inclusively. You know, I call down a randomized list in my constitutional law class. It would be so weird for me not to do that now, right? Uh, but that is a self-conscious inclusive habit that I've only developed over time. So you seek to improve the system as a whole, not just your corner. And then the biggest change happens in these last two rows where you give sources of non-inclusive behavior the opportunity to grow and you accept your own mistakes as invitations to learn, right? So this is actually some of the most counterintuitive stuff because, you know, we hear a lot about cancel culture and I think that the, you know, fear of cancel culture is overblown. Oftentimes I think that we're talking about a consequence culture rather than a cancel culture. But when we talk about sort of canceling somebody who, in the real sense of like ostracizing somebody who's engaged in non-inclusive behavior, that we are the, at the center, my center, are, are truly against, right? Because we believe that sources need to be given that opportunity to grow because guess what? Someday that person is going to be you, right? This is a game of musical chairs. You do not have the option of just being the enlightened person all the time. Sometimes you're going to mess up and you're going to be really glad on that day that you've built a culture rich in allies because those allies will knock on your door too and say, that was terrible. You know, you know I just want to make sure that that doesn't happen again. We made mistakes like that and we grew past them. Can we right. team together to help you grow past the mistake that you just made? Nice. And that allows you to adopt a growth mindset. This is Dolly Chuk's work about how um, we say growth mindset, growth mindset, growth mindset in every um, domain, right? Uh, except for DNI. And so, why is it that in DNI we suddenly go back to fixed mindset? And her diagnosis is that um, we go back because there's a moral valence to it. That if you make a mistake in constitutional law, you just don't know constitutional law. If you make a mistake in DNI, suddenly you're a bad person, right? And so that makes mistakes much more threatening because they go to your very personhood, right? So the identity threat is much greater there. Yeah, that's so, so interesting. We, we could talk for two days about these topics. There's a ton of great questions and, and great uh, comments coming in. Uh, my team can maybe put in the chat, we, uh, we did an interview with, um, with Microsoft, the Chief Diversity Officer, Lindsay Ray, who I know you worked with closely as well. Um, and she, she talked widely about the whole allyship project that they've been rolling out that's gone huge at Microsoft with your work and our work. Um, so that my team can put a link in so folks can download that, listen to it as a podcast. It was a Friday sometime back and maybe they can put some links in on inclusion. I know we've, we've put your book in there and a number of other things, but if there's anything you, you want uh, folks to link to, uh, you can throw it in the chat as well. Uh, let's, let's talk about the triangle um, and, and the sort of structure and architecture of allyship. Tell us a little bit more about how you see this. We've got, we've got five more minutes. Great, yeah, so uh, you know, the, the million dollar question is, you know, how do I get from one point in this allyship maturity curve to the end of it, right? So you know, give me a tool that I can actually use starting directly after this talk that would help me to get from point A to point B, right? And so it's really in response to that sort of operational challenge that we developed the empathy triangle. The triangle piece of this is that every allyship interaction contains at least three parties, right? There's the ally, there's a source of non-inclusive behavior, and there's the person who's been affected by that non-inclusive behavior. So again, the ally is coming in from the side to you know, help with the conversation. So these questions you know, around the horn are all questions that the ally is asking of themselves about you know, the other two, the, all three vertices really of the triangle, right? So the question that the ally has to ask, ask of herself or himself is, have I reflected on my role? And the subs there are, do I have the proper motivations for stepping in as an ally, right? So am I doing this to virtue signal or to get a cookie? You know, our acid test question is, you know, if nobody knew I was doing this, would I still do this because I believe in an inclusive culture? If the answer to that is yes, then you're probably safe. The second one is, am I informed enough to act, right? So part of this is, am I informed enough to act with regard to what just went, went down, like about what, what the relationship between the source and the affected person is? Are my facts right? 
but also more deeply, am I informed enough about the demographic? Before I want to become an ally to the trans community, I better, you know, know a little bit, right, about trans issues, right? And oftentimes people overestimate how much time this takes. Ijo Omolua says, if we have time to live it, you have time to Google it. Oftentimes the answer is just a Google search away, right? And then am I maximizing my effectiveness about thinking about systemic solutions? This goes to you know, the example I gave earlier about my con law class, which is I noticed I was calling on men to my shame more than I was calling on women. I decided I was gonna fix it, did well for about two classes and then abjectly went back to my prior practices when I became stressed or tired or passionate about the material. So I tied myself to the mass and said, this is obviously not something I can trust myself to do. So I need a more systemic solution. I went to my assistant, Corey, and I said, Corey, randomize a list for me, hand it to me, and I will call down that list every class, right? So no matter how tired I am, I can call down a list. I at least have that capability, right? Uh, and so this is a very Iris Bonat, you know, type systemic institutional design solution uh, that allowed me to be a better ally to the women in my class. Have I considered my relationship to the affected person of source? So we're not robots, right? Uh, you know, going back to the, we're not stick figures. So, you know, this, it matters, like whether or not you're best friends with the source or with the affected person. If you're best friends with the source, then maybe you're the one who knocks on the source's door and puts your arm around them and says, okay. let's throw together past this, right? Moving to the next leg, am I helping the person as they want to be helped, right? So, so often allies go barreling in to the point where some organizations have started to talk about responsible allyship, right? Like, don't just go barreling in and help the person as you deem fit to help them. Like, ask them questions about how they wish to be helped, right? So the subs here, could my intervention be received as unhelpful, embarrassing, or patronizing? Should I seek permission or advice, right? So in the Uncovering Talent survey, one of the things was, you know, as a Latinx person, when I come in late to a meeting and someone says, oh, I see you're on Hispanic time, and I don't know whether to speak up or not. If I were an ally doing the wrong thing, I could jump in and I could say, oh, my colleague probably really didn't appreciate that. And he's a Latino identity. And do you understand the whole history of oppression against Latinos? And this is a stereotypical remark. And I could just get up on my soapbox. Meanwhile, my Latino colleague might be like, I had an agenda I wanted to right. get through, right? So you wasted all of that time. Or alternatively, I know the source. So I had a way of handling this that you just you know, took all the power away from me and humiliated my friend right, in the bargain, right? So ask you know, if you can. Sometimes the behavior is so egregious that you have to speak up. Say you're the team leader, someone says something egregious, and you need to show people that you're taking care of it, right? Uh, then you can intervene, but intervene in your own voice. So say, as someone who's invested in inclusive culture, I believe X. So it's the impact on you. Don't draw the affected party into right. it. And then last but not least, and most importantly, I think, am I being an ally to the source of non-inclusive behavior? Most importantly, in the sense of this is a least intuitive part, right? Am I separating the behavior from the person and separating intent from impact? So with regard to the source, Again, there's a huge amount of resistance of saying like, oh, do I really have to be an ally to like the Amy Coopers of the world, the woman who called the police and the poor black bird watcher in Central Park, mm -hmm. right? And our answer is no, you don't actually have to be an ally to the source when it's somebody out in the world like that. But if it's in your organization, if it's the person in your organization who's defending Amy Cooper, right, right. at least it's a point of departure, although not a point of arrival, yes, you do have an obligation to be an ally to the source. And when we get further pushback on that, we say, actually think about this as a game of musical chairs, right? So some days you're the ally, some days the affected person, some days, unfortunately, you're the source. So we can close with this anecdote, which is kind of a, a kind of grim place to end because it doesn't reflect well on me at all. But yeah. I'm teaching this class on the leadership, diversity, and inclusion, David. And, you know, there are three Asian women in the class and I call them by each other's name repeatedly, right? And the more I think about it, the worse I get over the course of three classes. And this is humiliating to me, both because it's a class on leadership and diversity and inclusion, for goodness sake, and also I am of Asian descent, have been on the wrong end of all Asian people look alike, right, and have been called, you know, the names of people who don't look anything right. like me. So I was a source, and I had to realize that I was a source. And so on class four, I just took it in after apologizing to the individual woman, of course, individually first. I took it into the class, and I said, we've learned about allyship. I'm really glad I taught you, right, about this empathy triangle, because I actually need your help to be my ally as a source. So one of the ways in which you can help me, right, if you deem fit to do it, is to actually interrupt me if I get this wrong. So I'm really gonna try not to get this wrong, but if I get this wrong, either with regard to these three individuals or with right. anybody else, I need you to stop me right away and reference this conversation, right, as okay. your aegis for doing that. 
So it wasn't sort of puppies and rainbows immediately, like these things take time. But by the end, although I certainly don't wish that, you know, I'm not glad that it happened, but we were closer as a group, right, because we weathered that than we would have been had it never occurred in the first place. So yeah. that I'm totally confident. So I think this is such an important piece of the empathy triangle that we need to have empathy for the individuals who are yeah. uh, the sources of non-inclusive behavior. There's so much to say, and unfortunately we're, we're gonna need to wrap in about 30 seconds and get, get, let people get to the next things. Uh, Kenji, so much to say, I've got like five articles I wanna like write and run past you and, and see if we can kind of get some of these sort of really critical questions answered. Um, you know, things like what is the difference between good covering and bad covering and, um, you know, ha ha all this stuff around allyship. So there's a lot more to say. Hopefully we get to have some great conversations. I think I can speak for everyone when I say we're all looking forward to your next book. Um, so hopefully you can use this uh, as, a, as a motivation to, to do the very tough job of sitting down writing. I know how hard that is. There's a lot of people just ready for your book. So uh, use that. Just uh, Gabe, do you want to put up the poll and um, just as, as I, as I um, just some closing comments, but folks, before you jump off, we'd love to get a click from you of the poll, including a nothing for now, thanks, if that's where you are, of just kind of things you might be interested in uh, in, in, uh, in this area. Um, so I, I, Kenji, just um, super appreciate your time, your excellence, your expertise. I, I loved your comment earlier that this is your authentic self, like a suit and tie is your authentic <laughs> exactly, self yes. that you're not covering. I love the, the professionalism you, you bring. You're, you're better dressed than I've been in a year, um, which is, is uh, the world we've been in. But uh, thanks for being your authentic self and for the work that you do. Um, you're doing some really, really important work and, and pushing the envelope. Um, I look forward to, to finding some creative, you know, dynamic ways to, to collaborate that makes sense for everyone. Um, but just for now, thanks for your time and focus and uh, really wish you well with, uh, with everything you're doing going forward. Thank you so much. It was a wonderful conversation. It's always a pleasure.